Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, I'm Steve, a senior tech evangelist at AWS, and you, sir, are? I am Norm, the senior dev at AWS, focusing on .NET. Okay, so today we want to talk through developing serverless Don Echo on AWS, and we're going to run pretty much to the hour. Um, we are going to go briefly through some announcements for .NET development on AWS that have happened over the last year that you may have missed. I mean, we have a lot of announcements, so just to point some of those out. But we're going to spend the bulk of our time in updates to our Cloud Mosaic sample application. So let's get started on the news, as it were. And um, number one, we're thrilled to have joined the .NET Foundation. So we've been doing .NET at AWS for quite a long time now, longer than even we've been at the company. We've been there. A while. Ten, ten years. Ten now. years. So we're really excited by this. There's a blog post out there. You can go and read more about it. Um, but yeah, hugely exciting. Even more exciting from my point of view. Um, we have a new version of our tools for PowerShell, version 4. Um, we've taken those monolithic modules that we had. And they are still available. You can still use them. But we've taken those modules, and we've broken them apart. we factored them into per-service modules. So now you only need to download the modules for the services that you want to work with in PowerShell including if you're writing Lambda functions in PowerShell. You don't need to take those big monolithic modules anymore. It's a great uh, speed improvement. We've also added support for mandatory parameters, which has been a, a long requested feature. Um, if you are a PowerShell tools user, I suggest run, don't walk to get this. It is awesome. We have a new toolkit coming out. Oh, uh, well, it is out, actually. Uh, toolkit for JetBrains Rider. Uh, just like our Visual Studio Code toolkit, this is targeted at serverless development. Um, it's free. It's available on the JetBrains Rider marketplace. Uh, it's also open source on GitHub. So if you want to get involved with that, I uh, highly encourage you. And last but not least, the Cloud Mosaic sample that we first showed at reInvent last year, and we're going to be using again today, is open source and is on GitHub. Now, the master branch that's there today comes with full workshop-style documentation that goes into how the application works, how it's architected. You can follow the steps that we went through last year. Um, the code for today's presentation is also there. It's in a different branch. Uh, we'll come to that shortly. Um, so you can take this away and, and play with it. The key thing here, though, is that the demo application today is designed for um, showing you how you can do a service.net application on, on AWS. It's not going to teach you how to do mosaics. That's not its intent. So bear that one in mind. All right. Cloud Mosaic 2019 edition. Mm -hmm. I like that term. So what is Cloud Mosaic? So if you didn't see the session last year or you're not familiar with this, Cloud Mosaic is a web application that as a user who's authenticated and signed in to upload an image file and combine that with thumbnails from a tile gallery to make a mosaic image. And then when they click on that mosaic image and zoom in, you see all the individual little thumbnails that make it up. Okay? Now, as I just said, this application is designed to demonstrate serverless application development on AWS. It's not designed to teach you how to do mosaics. That's not the point of this session. Um, but it's designed, you know, deploying to services with the tools you're familiar with, the toolkit for Visual Studio, our extensions for the .NET CLI, and some services like Lambda, Batch, Step Functions, etc. cetera. Um, I was going to say something else about it, and I've forgotten what it was. And you just twitched. Which I, I am going to twitch throughout <laughs> the day. That's what my job is. Oh, yeah, I know what it was. Um, yeah, the other thing is that we're not going to go too deep into how the application actually works today. All right? Uh, if you're really interested, I would go and check out the GitHub repo. We'll give it you later on. Um, that has, as I say, all the documentation that you need that describes it. We're going to be focused on the new features that we've added um, for this year. But, but very briefly, Cloud Mosaic consists of three primary subsystems. We have a tile gallery ingestion system that uses batch and lambda function to process these uh, incoming tile galleries and create tiles from them. So resize those images down to be used as thumbnails. Then we have a mosaic rendering workflow that uses AWS step functions, a uh, number of lambda functions operating in sequence to take that image that the user uploads, take the tile gallery, and create a mosaic image. And that's all tied together by a web application front end that is hosted on AWS Fargate. Um, uses Amazon Cognito for end user authentication, pulling container images from ECR, and Parameter Store from Systems Manager for runtime configuration. So, Cloud Mosaic 2019. So, we've actually stood this up in a production site, and we're going to encourage you to visit this URL, uh, sign up, and if you like, upload photos from your phone during the session. And when we get time, hopefully we'll have time. We'll go and see what you guys have, have uploaded and created mosaics from. Now, we're going to leave this site up for a few days. But then at the weekend, we're going to tear it all down. So we'll delete everything that gets uploaded. Don't worry. Nothing's going to be left there on the internet forever. It'll be gone. Um, the source is in the GitHub repository, uh, aws-samples slash cloudmosaic-.net. And today's code is in the reInvent 2019 branch. Okay? 
the master branches, last year's presentation with the architectural docs. So Norm, I think we want to take a look at the app and show yeah, you how it works. Let's see what it looks like here. You can all see my amazing UI skills. So here we are, it's a rather simple application. You can log on, which I already did. Um, this year, for our new version, we use role-based uh, authentication. So if you do go create an account and upload mosaics, you won't see like creating galleries or the feed. Those we put in as yet to be part of the admin group. That was one of the features we wanted to take advantage of with our Cognito integration. So we can go click on mosaics. We can go click a picture. And let's see what we got here. Steve and I went and got, saw Aerosmith the other day, so we'll make a mosaic out of that picture we took and make that a mosaic out of all the pictures that I found on Twitter tagged with Reddit or reInvent. So, but that's basically what the site is. You upload pictures, and it'll go and render all those things. But we use all those underlying AWS services to use this thing. So overall, the application is a pretty simplistic application, but it is a good demonstration of how you can use .NET and AWS serverless services. Yeah. And the other key part of it is it's a 100% end-to-end serverless. So no infrastructure devs or DevOps engineers were harmed in the making of the demo. Um, <laughs> So for this year, what's new? What do we want to change? So last year was very much a V1. It was the first time we presented this sample. And uh, it kind of lacked error handling. In fact, there was no error handling at all. So if you did anything with the application and it happened to fail, you got no feedback. You didn't know what had gone wrong. So we wanted to fix that, improve some usability. Over the last year, obviously, Lambda has made many strides of performance improvements. So we want to take advantage of some of those techniques. And it says here that we re-architected the front end with ASP.NET Core 3.0. That's actually not strictly true. It was ASP.NET Core 3.0, but Norm, in his wisdom, the night before last, decided to convert the whole thing to .NET Core 3.1. The it's good news good is, to make it exciting right before, right? The good news is it still works. It was um, a very simple upgrade. Yeah, very simple. So. And it was fun to stress out Steve with the idea of doing that. <laughs> he told me the morning of the talk. Um, OK, so let's walk through what's new then, tile ingestion. So this is the first of the subsystems inside the application. And again, we're not going to go through the architectural details of this too much uh, today. Those are in the, in the repo. But the basic process is the user gives us a zip file containing images. That gets handed off to a batch process that unzips that zip file and sends each image to Amazon S3. That triggers a Lambda function to run that then analyzes that image for color data, resizes it to be a tile, and then saves it in a name gallery. So what do we want to improve? Well, in the 2018 edition of the app, the user had no idea how many tiles were actually inside a gallery. It's kind of small little usability improvement. We were thinking, how could we do this um, without changing the code that we already had? Norm's solution, which he's going to go through now, was to make use of DynamoDB streams. Right. So, and also, you know, this is, again, we're using Cloud Mosaic to just use this as a vehicle to teach you. So this is the part of the talk, I think, is really, if you haven't really used much of .NET and Lambda together, this will be that level setting. And then the rest of the talk, we're going to get more into some more advanced topics. Mm -hmm. So. We get into Visual Studio. So this is the solution that you will see if you get that repository. Um, and most of those, are those three different components that Steve mentioned are in different solutions folder. And there's also this Cloud Mosaic um, project as well. The two templates in there, first is our resources template. That creates all my common resources, like my DynamDB tables and any VPC settings. And then a lot of the demos we do today here is going to be through Visual Studio and the command line, because I usually find that's an easy way to learn how these services work and how to put them together. But then when I go to prod, I want to actually use a pipeline for that. And that's what this other template does, is it will actually create our code pipeline with that. So if you clone the repository, you'll have that. All of the build scripts are also in the repo for this as well. Okay, so the gallery generator, this is the part of the tile ingestion that we've talked about. And it's made up of three projects. The first project is just a regular console application that its job is to essentially download the user's zip file and extract the zip file of the images in there and upload this to S3. And for that, we run that console application as a container in batch. Now, as it uploads those images to S3, this is where Lambda comes into play, because Lambda will listen to those events. So basically, every time we upload an image to S3, that triggers our process raw image function. So this one has a fair amount of code, but mostly what this Lambda function's job is to go and do some metadata processing, go compute what's the average color of that image, create some thumbnails that we'll eventually use to render the mosaic, and then ultimately it's going to go save into our DynaDB table. You see over in the AWS Explorer here, I actually have 
a gallery items table, which we're restoring all those individual items, and a galleries table as well. So what we needed to solve for this you know, ability to know how many gallery or tiles were in a gallery is we essentially need to do some aggregation. Right? We needed on the gallery table a tile count attribute that contained how many gallery items were on there. And this is where streams came in very useful, to use Dynamic Streams to, to do the aggregation. So what streams are is when you create a table or you can modify a table, you can say, I want to enable a stream and any mutation you do to that table, whether that's an insert, an update, or remove, Dynaby will write the, that event to the stream, which then you can have code that listens, that reads from that stream, and in our case, do our aggregation. And luckily, you can just easily say, I want Lambda to read from that stream. So just to point out here in our confirmation script, this is where we declared our gallery items table. This is also where we enabled streams. You can obviously enable this in the console, you know, every SDK out there. This is just how I did it. Now, for my case, all I really care about is was an item inserted or removed. I don't care any data, which is why I'm telling Dynaby only put the keys to the stream. Um, if I wanted to do processing of the data, I could change that type to say I want the new data or the old data or both, whichever one you needed. But the, 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 low, the least amount of data in there uses um, less read units on your DynaB table. So let's take a look at our actual new function that we wrote here. So this is a pretty classic example of how you write a .NET Lambda um, function. You basically have a method out here, takes in an event class, and for performance reasons, DynaBase doesn't want to call your Lambda function for every single muta mutation operation, it's going to batch it up and it batches it up in a collection of records. So because we could be getting an invocation into our Lambda function that's affecting multiple galleries at the same time, um, I want to basically compute how much I want to increment that tile count kind of attribute for each one of the galleries. So that's what this first for loop is doing. You're basically looking through all those for each gallery. Is it an insert, increment, and decrement? Because I don't want to call Dynamity for every single one of those records. I want to group them up as much as I possible. So then we actually update DynaDB. So we're going to loop through all our unique galleries and increment that using the DynaDB update item operation. Now, what, how we do that is we use DynaDB's expressions capability. Because I'm going to be writing a lot of names to the same gallery table. There's a high chance I can get, like, can, you know, I'm going to write it and someone else is going to do another write to it and get into those um, concurrency issues. But by using this expression here, I can tell Dynaby to do that increment as an atomic update. I'm not reading the data and writing it. I'm just telling Dynaby, do this increment the tile count attribute with this variable here, with this value we computed above, as one atomic operation. So that's a great way of using AWS, uh, Dynaby expressions to be able to take advantage of some of those quick features. Um, the way this works is the TC variable gets swapped in with the actual name of my tile count attribute that I want to store. The colon increment variable gets swapped in with the actual value that I have. So overall, that's pretty easy. Because that's all we had to do. Now, to you did things. mention, though, that we're getting a batch of records. So do I have any control over that batch size? Right. So when you set up the event source, which we'll show in a minute, you can actually say how much I want in there. That'll be the max that it will send to you. Dynaby will send to you as soon as, you know, whenever it's convenient to do it, though. So they won't wait until you have that much in there. So let's talk a little bit about how we deploy this, though. So we have a serverless uh, template here because we're going to use CloudFormation to deploy our Lambda function. Now, Steve showed we have three different subsystems, and even in those subsystems, we have different moving parts. So overall, there's a lot of moving parts in our system. And for that, we use Parameter Store to centralize all of the configuration in there. Parameter Store is a feature of Systems Manager. So in my CloudFormation template, I say I want to pass in as a parameter this um, parameter key from Parameter Store, which my main CloudFormation resources template, when it creates the table, it also writes the name of the table to Parameter Store. Now, what I do with that parameter is if you look in how I declare my Lambda function, which that's what this resource is, and the main thing you need to specify is here's the handler, which identifies what's the actual function you want to call. As you can imagine, we're using reflection to find that piece of code. 
And then in the environment variable, we're passing in the value from parameter store. So my lambda function in the constructor part is basically looking to see, oh, there's the environment variable and set that table value. So this is how I can have that independent unit of code that's not tied to any specific tables or any configuration. I can just pass that in based on when I do my deployment. Now in Visual Studio, we can just right click on this and say publish to Lambda. And because we have a CloudFormation template, we're gonna do a CloudFormation based deployment where we specify the stack name. Uh, we give it a bucket to store our temporary artifacts and we push publish. So if you haven't seen it before, that's the, the wizard that comes with the AWS toolkit for Visual Studio. So you can go and get that from the Visual Studio marketplace. It's free. Um, various other wizards and features in there. So ways when you do that publishing, we're basically doing a .NET publish on, on, the, on, the, on the machine. We're zipping that up. We're uploading that at S3. And then we're updating the CloudFormation template to say, um, this is where your actual build artifacts are in S3, and go create the stack or update in our case here, because we've actually um, already stood this up before, so we just did an update. Um, and if we go look in our AWS Explorer, we can see here's that function that we have. We can do some remote test invocations, update the configuration from here. We can also go to event sources and actually set up some of our event sources. In our case here, I set up my DynamDB event source by pushing the add, selecting my stream, and then choosing the, the batch size. I left it at the default, which is 100 items. So other than that, that's it. And we just added that function, and we didn't change any other backend components, and we added the aggregation to our system. Um, now, I didn't just deploy to prod. Um, we did actually have a different dev stack, so that would just use. I'm going to bring that up. This is my dev stack over here. And I can go to galleries. So my dev stack doesn't currently have any galleries. I can go and choose my, here we'll choose that same reInvent gallery and upload that. So what this is basically doing is it's taking our gallery, it's obviously uploading right now to S3, and then it's telling our, our front end is basically saying go start our batch job um, to process that zip file that we just uploaded. And that batch job is downloading the zip file, then up uploading everything to S3, which is triggering that process raw image lambda function that we saw. And then the new thing that we added without changing of our existing code is when we save to DynamDB from the process raw image function, it now triggers our new gallery items, our, our gallery stream processor. And so that's all completed. And if I would have had even more usability, that would have automatically refreshed, but we'll just push F5. And you can see tile kind of got updated there. Now, so by adding this Lambda function, we added some aggregation to our system without changing any backend components. And the only thing we did was that Lambda function and added the columns in the UI. And that's all we had to do. Cool. All right. So just recapping on the tile guide updates that Norm was talking about, so DynamoDB stream events. Um, configuration through environment variables to our Lambda functions, and then deploying them with the toolkits, um, publishing with it. All right, let's move on to the Mosaic workflow subsystem then, because we've done a little bit more work here than, than that. So this, again, is a very simple system. Uh, it takes an image file from the user, plus the name of a gallery that they want to use. It analyzes the image in terms of what's its average color data in pixel blocks, matches that against tiles in the tile gallery, and then uses those matched tiles to go off and build this mosaic image. It's a workflow. Now, what we wanted to change here was error handling. So last year's version, there wasn't any. If the state machine, the set function workflow stopped for any reason, there was no feedback to the user. Um, so we wanted to fix that. We also wanted to take advantage of Lambda layers. So that was announced at the reInvent last year, just as we were doing this talk. Um, we added to toolkit pretty, uh, tooling pretty soon after, but we wanted to take advantage now inside the application. And the Lambda layer allows us to package common dependencies. Remember, we're using a workflow here with composed of multiple Lambda functions. Take those common dependencies into a shared layer and reduce the bundle size the, for deployment. And then also pre-jit the layer, right, to optimize cold start time. So here's what the state function, the step machine looks like. Get the rubber in a minute. Um, in 2018, you can see we had a bunch of Lambda tasks to create the color map for the image, 
find the tiles, choose a renderer, is it a small image, use a small renderer, a medium, a large, etc. But if any one of those lambdas failed, it just stopped, nothing, no feedback to the user. In 2019, you can see that we've chained everything off to a notify at the end. So even if an error occurs, we can give the user some feedback of, hey, this, this just didn't work. Um, we've also, you'll notice, chained the renderers together now. So if the small renderer fails, if it runs out of memory, It'll, it'll, the medium renderer will get invoked. If that falls out of memory, the large renderer will be invoked. We also, because we invited you guys to upload images during the presentation, we added an extra Lambda function just to call recognition at the start, just to make sure the images were safe to use on screen. So, um, fair few changes to the Mosaic workflow. I think we should go dig into them. Okay. And while you do that, I'm going to take a photo of you and add it to the feed. All right. Okay, so let's go back over to Visual Studio. <laughs> uh, anyway, so here we are back in Visual Studio. The mosaic step function, this is their whole part in the solution that does all the rendering. You can see it's got several projects for each of the Lambda functions that's involved in actually rendering a mosaic. Um, we also have a state machine JSON file that actually represents um, our, our state machine and native step functions. So the first thing we don't want to talk about is we added error handling in here. We didn't have any error handling before. So what, how that works is basically it works a lot like .NET, where you have this, a catch clause in your state machine. In this case, I have a catch clause catching all except all errors, and if there's an error, we call our notify um, step function or la lambda function. What this string here is is essentially what step functions does is it stores the state of your current execution as a JSON document. And every Lambda function gets that, that in there, and it gets, you know, ret returns it back out. This is a JSON path of where step function should put that error in that state document. So what that means in, for .NET is if we look at our moderate Lambda function. So here, again, we have our function handler. And that's just a convention. I have to call things function handler. You can call it whatever you want. You just have to make sure the handler string reflects that. But it takes in a state class. Now, this state class is a class I wrote. It's part of Cloud Mosaic. And it contains all the things that I want to represent as part of my execution, um, including there's that exception type there. So my Lambda functions basically take in a state object. Um, this serializer that's registered in our Lambda function is what causes the JSON document that they have in step functions to be converted into our state object, and then we could make any changes we want to that state object within our Lambda function, and if we do, and then we return that state object. So that becomes the new state of our execution environment, or our step function execution. If I want to get to the JSON, though, is that possible? Yeah, so I'm using typed classes, because I'm used to being, I always like my POCO classes, but if you want to work with more of a dynamic nature, you could say, I just want to have it test in a, take in a stream, and then work with the stream directly. Um, this serializer is ultimately using Newtonsoft. So you could just have this be a J object and then work with the J object directly. So if you want to work in a more dynamic way, that's, that either way is fun. Because as I think Steve's hinting at, it's important. It's like anything that's not modeled in your state object, and it doesn't get, so it won't get serialized into the state object, when you're, it won't get returned back out. So you would potentially lose it. So if you're just, if you're using a type class, make sure you have everything in there that you care about. Yeah, you might see that if you're following an example online for something like a, a node-based Lambda where they inject dynamically into the JSON structure. With C Sharp, you're using a POCO. So the other thing we, want, we talked about is uh, we wanted to have our renderers have more resiliency. So if we look at our, our renderers, so we, we have our three renderers, which are the same code, just deployed with different memory settings so we can optimize how much memory we're using to render it, um, we can have another catch block to say, I want to catch an add a memory exception. And if so, we can fall back to the next render, which has more memory. And of course, the medium does the same thing. It's an add a memory exception. It'll fall back to the large one. So that gave us a bit more resilience, but still allowing us to try our best to optimize how much memory we want to use. Now, hang on a second. You're catching an out of memory exception. I know we get aggregate exception. So how is this working? That is correct. So by default, a .NET Lambda function that's async will return back up to Lambda as an aggregate exception. Um, that, I will say, was probably a mistake on our part when we designed the, the .NET, Tor, .NET Core Lambda runtime. 
Um, it's something we will fix in the next version. But you can get around that right now by when you deploy your Lambda function, you specify this environment variable here, unwrap aggregate exception. So that tells the Lambda runtime, if they set this environment variable and an aggregate exception was caught by it, then rethrow the inner exception. And then that will make step functions be able to do the right catch clauses based off that. Um, it's what will probably change in the next um, behavior, or next runtime, but we can't change it now because that would be a breaking change. Okay, so that was how we handled error handling. Let's talk about layers. Mm -hmm. So as Steve mentioned, layers were launched last year, and primarily they were an idea to just provide your Lambda function with common code or common data files. But for .NET, we had to think of a way of, because like .NET's not really designed to say, my code is running in this part of the file system, and the layer, which is in a completely different part of the file system, say, oh, by the way, include those DLLs that are com completely separate. We needed to make that process somehow smooth which is what we worked on on our CLI commands. So if we look at our CLI commands, so you can say .NET Lambda help. We have a few commands out there for managing layers. In particular, we have the publish layer command. Let's take a look at that one. So the top here is mostly just the usual parameters of credentials and regions and all those things. But there's a couple here that we do want to call out. First is the layer type. Layer type is a required parameter, although right now there's only one valid value. We made it required because we wanted to make sure we have room to add more layer types in the future. And that value is called a runtime package store. So what that is, so runtime package stores are not a concept that we made up. This is actually a .NET core concept. If you look at the .NET CLI, you can call .NET store help, and that's what we're actually building on. What .NET store does is, given a manifest file, go and create a, a directory with all of the assemblies that are, are referenced in that manifest file, along with any of their dependencies as well. And so Publish Layer builds on top of that to basically integrate that into the whole build pipeline of a Lambda function, including zipping that up, sending that up to S3, and also managing that you have the right settings for when you call the .NET store command. Now, we also have the package manifest command that points us to the manifest file. But the one I also really want to call out here is the enable package optimization. And this is the one, if you're, if you're worried about cold starts in .NET, this is the one you want to really pay attention to. Because what it will do is, when you create that runtime package store, is it will pre-jit all of the assemblies that get added to it. Meaning all the, the normal .NET IL that's put in, a, in an assembly will already be converted into the machine-specific instruction set. What that normally does at runtime gets done at compile time. Now, the trick, though, is, is when you run this command, you have to be running it on the same platform that you're going to be run, actually running your code. So you need to be running this on Amazon Linux to, get, to take advantage of this feature. I'm running on Windows, so I can't use that feature. Um, so what I do is I'll actually use code build to create that layer and then take the ARM for that and use that in my Lambda functions that I deploy from my Windows box. So if we take what the, back to Visual Studio, first here, this mosaic layer XML, this is my manifest file. This lists all of the common dependencies for all those Lambda functions in my, my state machine. So this is just a, an MS build project file. Yep. And I only need my top level dependencies here. It'll, it'll follow the dependency chain. Correct. Said, right? For example, like we don't have AWS core in there. We just have the services. Core will be added in there. And you're right. This is just a project file. I could also create a layer just pointing at a Lambda function itself. But here, since I have six or seven Lambda functions. I just made one as a union of all those things. OK, and then let's take a look at our build spec file. So this is the build spec file I use in code build to actually create that layer. This is how you install our Lambda tools, which basically get installed from NuGet. Specify my, run, my layer type as a runtime package store, then my manifest file, and then I say, um, I want to optimize this. So if we go over to code build, code build. Here we 
Here's my build job. And we can look at its output here. It's maybe a little small. But you can see there's all this native image compilation stuff. So this is the stuff that we're doing at layer, at creation of the layer, which normally .NET would do at the runtime, at the startup time. And so this is where it really improves that cold start time. At the end of this job, we get our ARN. So this is the ARN uh, of the layer that contains all of now our pre-jitted assemblies. So let's tell, now we need to tell our deployments to, that we want to use that layer. So what we're going to do now is go back to our serverless template file, which lists all of our Lambda functions. And they're all declared, in this case, as an ADBIS serverless function, which is part of the SAM transformation. A feature of the SAM transformation that we can take advantage of is called the global section. I can just say up here globally, To use that layer. So this is going to apply that to all the functions. I don't have to go and do this individually. Right. So all, I think, seven functions we have, we'll just pick that one up, and they'll all take advantage of using that pre-jitted version. So in fact, if we go down to deploy this, so it's important that, like, you know, like I said, we do demoing from Visual Studio, but all the deployment Visual Studio can do from the command line, like this. So we can run that, and that'll start spinning up. So I want to go take a look at some of the mosaics that maybe we created while we're, this is going. This will go for about Hopefully. a minute or so. So if we go over, let me just refresh here. Oh, someone was good and went running. Someone went running, yeah. Making cool. us look bad. We need to fix that, that rotation, though. <laughs> <laughs> Next year's improvement. Very cool flat. Ooh, yeah. the lava uh, exploding. Volcano. Cool. Can, in you click in on, can you click in on one of those? Something? Well, I did click the right, because these take a uh, long time to load. Ah, uh, there we go. So here's someone's Lego guy, I think, and we can look in and see it's made up of, this is your random stuff, That's the right? random gallery, yeah. All right. Cool. Got some people over at reInvent at the expo, looks like. Zooming in. And, there's some Andy Jassy and Werner is hiding in there. So that's what it is. Thanks for taking part. All right. Let's see if our, our deployment so We'll leave it up for a couple of days, but then we'll tear the whole thing down. So it'll all, <laughs> it'll all disappear. OK. So now that we've excellently stalled while the deployment happened, let's just see what actually <laughs> happened here. So we take a look here. And I, did I not save? Did you not save? He did not save. No. Uh, we'll run that again. Um, but ultimately, let's see. OK, so while that's yeah. running, you maybe see, um, you'll see when it's zipping up things, it's only zipping up just the DLLs that are part of the project. When I messed up the first time and forgot to save, you might have saw that there was the Amazon DLLs being put in the package. Now the package only contains just the project DLLs. And those are also going to be the pre-jitted version of those. Now, the way that works is at the top of this uh, at the output, it'll say, hey, let's go download. It, it saw that I declared a layer in there. Let's go check that out. Let's go inspect it out. This is a feature of our .NET Lambda tools. And it says, oh, this is one of those runtime package stores that was created with the .NET tools. And so it knows. Let's go download the manifest file that's uploaded to S3 that was part of the publish layer command. So when we download that manifest file, we eventually call .NET publish on all these projects. And in that, when you call .NET publish, you can pass in the manifest file there. And the, then the .NET Core CLI tools know, hey, don't include these assemblies when you do a publish because they're already in our target output. So that's how we can actually do that. So ultimately, with the publish layer command and everything, we can kind of stream everything together so you don't have to think about how you actually glue together this DLLs in a separate folder in your action right here. It'll all just work via that command. So this will just finish up. Oh, I think it did finish. Um, so you can see here again, here's the zip of just our project DLLs. And if we look at the top here, 
you can see uh, there's where we inspected the layer and saw it was a runtime package store and downloaded the manifest file. So All right. that's how we can take advantage of layers and your Lambda function. So. All right. So let's go and uh, recap. That's the two key takeaways then. So you can get at the inner exception, the real exception, use that environment variable. The runtime will take care of rethrowing the inner exception for you. Um, the procedure of creating uh, Lambda layers and consider using that package optimization switch with a code build image building on Amazon Linux so you can get you know, really fast cold start times. All right, the front end. This is where the biggest set of changes have, have come in. Um, the front end itself, remember I said it was an ASP.NET core application. It's running on AWS Fargate, so it's fully serverless. Um, users who are registered and signed in can create new tile galleries um, and upload Im image mosaics. But what do we want to change? Well, we were thinking last year, this is a web application. And at some point, we'd really like to make a mobile front end for it. But all of the code to launch that batch backend process of the tile gallery ingestion or the step function, uh, the mosaic rendering workflow, was done inside the web app itself. So we need to refactor that out into a REST API. We want to try ASP.NET Core 3.0 server side, or 3.1 server side Blazor in AWS. No one wants to try that out. The cool news is it really works really well. Um, and then take advantage of WebSockets and Amazon API Gateway um, to bring more feedback to the user of what's going on in this whole procedure. So we're going to start with the REST API project. I think you're going to describe this one? Yeah. <clears throat> so, you, yeah. You're going to describe them all, but, you know. Oh, you make me do all the work again. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we wanted to just, like I said, we create a REST API project. Um, the REST API project, we want to make sure you have only authenticated users using that. Um, we use um, Cognito to do all of our authentication and then use it to have Ben Jot tokens that we, they'll validate and see which permissions you have. So, let's go back to the code. And in the API folder is our Cloud Mosaic project. Now, this is just a standard ASP.NET Core 3.1 project here. And we can see here we've got our controllers out there. Like, here's our controller for getting um, all the mosaics. We're using the authorization attributes um, and using querying data D for getting the feed, which is the one that requires more permissions. We make sure you've got an admin policy because Steve and I are in the admin group. So all that is the standard stuff that you're used to using, including using all of the Swagger UI or attributes as well. Because part of it, we wanted to make sure that both ASP.NET Core works well in AWS and the community's things work. So um, we also used nSwag as well to show our uh, open API as the UI, that common tool that a lot of us use. So in fact, if I go back to my dev stack and I type Swagger here, you can see there's that UI that if you've been done, done race the papers before, you might have used this before. And keep in mind, this whole ASP.NET Core project um, is uh, with this front end is actually using, is running on Lambda as well. Um, now, so this shows all of our different projects here. And again, we, we mentioned that we need to be authorized to call these. I can't call these without, you know, an actual JOT token. So at this point, I don't have a UI. Um, to get that, that's done as part of my front end. So if you look at our solution, I have just this utility project out here that has like a console-based version of a login that will also vend me a JOT token. I'm not going to look at that code today. You're welcome to go check that out in the repo. But we can go, go run that from the command line. We can say .NET run and enter our names, not with a tab. And so that has logged us onto Cognito and given us a JOT token. Now that JOT token, you can see, has all the claims in there. So this is where it says who I am, as well as that I'm in the admin group, which is what's allowing me to get the special permissions in there. So I can go take that JOT token, go back to my UI. And mostly what we're just trying to show here is that you can just use the tools that you're used to using. So here, this is the community tools. We can use that. We can go in, we can go and execute that to see the gallery that I uploaded previously. So all those things do work, and we do work in Lambda. The way the Cognito stuff works is basically in the startup page, when we configure our identification with Jot Bears, we're basically saying point this to our user pool in Cognito as the identity provider. So we didn't add any new libraries or anything. We just configured the classes that are part of ASP.NET Core to use Cognito as the source of authenticating 
the JWT tokens that got passed in. All right, so I think that's what we had time to show there. Basically, the hint was it just works and, and works as a Lambda function. Um, let's talk about Lambda here a little bit. All right, so the next change is hosting .NET Core 3.0, in this case, .NET Core 3.1 right. in Lambda, which is something we get asked about quite a lot. So as we know, .NET Core 2.1 is the current native version of Lambda out there. 3.1 is coming. We've got engineers back in Seattle quickly working on getting that out there. Um, I was impatient and wanted to do things today. You can use 3.1 today using Lambda custom runtimes. Um, our tooling supports it, um, as well as we have that NuGet package out there, Amazon Lambda runtime support which is basically an open source version of the APIs to work with the Lambda service. Um, we don't have time to go through the process of actually taking ASP.NET Core project to make work on Lambda. It's really quick. It takes about five or 10 minutes, and that blog post will walk you through it. Um, what I do want you to really take out of this session, though, is um, the new ready to run feature that was added as part of .NET Core 3.0. Because even if you don't want to do custom runtimes, the next version of of our Lambda runtime, you're going to want to have this enabled. And what ready to run is, is it's kind of like the, ready, the, the layers example we showed. Where ready to run it does the pre-jitting of all of your assemblies, not just your dependencies, but also your project assemblies. And they've done also a lot of work, Day is in the Microsoft team, they've done a lot of work to improve the pre-jitting process even better. Anecdotally, I have found when I've enabled this, this setting, even with my custom runtime, which means I have a 30 meg function because it includes the .NET Core runtime, the cold start time has been fairly close to the 2.1 Lambda runtime. Still a little bit longer, but fairly close. So if you don't want to do that now, but you're going to be using .NET Core 3.1 probably soon, you're going to want to set yourself up to use this. And what that means is, again, like layers, you need to enable that feature while building your projects on Linux. So let's take a look at how I did that. So here is our solution. Um, every Lambda project that we always create always has this defaults file. It's just a simple, easy file for us to have so you don't have to type every single one of those command line arguments when you deploy. Um, and it has this X MS build parameters, which are like extra parameters you want to pass to the underlying call to .NET publish that we do. So to do this customized, custom runtime is where we say do self-contained equal true so that you include the .NET Core 3.1 runtime. Now, when I do my production build, though, I do it a little differently, though. If we look at my build spec file, I specify a different config file. You can have multiple config files. You can have my development config file, my prod config file, however you want to set up your system. And then in my prod one, which is running out in code build again, I add an extra switch in the MS build parameters to say enable pub publish ready to set publish ready to true. And by doing that, that will greatly improve your cold snap performance. So if you're not building on Linux now, but you're planning on using .NET Core 3.1 in the future, you want to get yourself in a situation where you're going to have that as part of your pipeline. So. All right, Blazor. Blazor. OK, so Blazor. <laughs> um, I would love to spend a long time talking about Blazor, um, mm -hmm. but we're focusing on the AWS specific stuff here. Mostly what I wanted to do is to see, does Blazor work on AWS? And I found that using Blazor server-side, um, using AWS Fargate application load balancers worked really well. If you don't know what Blazor is, Blazor is the new web framework that came out as part of .NET Core 3.0, which essentially allows you to write your whole web application in .NET code. Um, so the site that we've been demoing today, I wrote four lines of JavaScript code in that everything else is just all C-sharp code. Um, Blazor works in two different modes. Um, first is server-side, which is what was GA'd as part of the 3.0 release. And what that means is the, it's actually rendering your, your page out on, on the server, in this case, our Fargate containers, um, and then using Signal R to send down to the browser what to actually display. The other way of using Blazor is WebAssembly. That part's not GA. It's supposed to be GA, I think, sometime in 2020. Um, and that's going to be basically running your .NET code in the browser using WebAssembly. Um, I'm very excited for that one. I'm, I suspect our next year's demos will be talking about that. Yep. Um, but we wanted to focus on what was GA today. Um, the main thing you need to know when you want to use Blazor, um, this is just a requirement of Blazor, is you do have to enable sticky sessions 
on your, on your app servers. There's a way that works with that communication. Is that easy to do? That is. Let's take a look here. So again, if we look at our CloudFormation template that set up all our common resources, this set up my application load balancer and my listeners, and then here's my default target group mm -hmm. that, that enabled the sticky sessions. So with our application load balancer, we have two target groups. One target group is our containers for Blazor. Another target group is for our Lambda functions, which we'll choose based off the URLs you use. Mm -hmm. So we used in this version, like last version, we're still using Cognito to do the authentication. Um, and that's the exact same package that we used last exact year, same right? package. It just works in Blazor. On the, on the slide there yep. is the, the name of the package out there. That URL out there has the whole tutorial on how you would actually set it up. It's overall fairly quickly, easy to do. You basically um, start up. You just say, I want to use Cognito Identity instead of the usual SQL Server. Update your logon pages to use the, the new Cognito User Manager. Other than that, pretty simple. So what I do want to talk about, though, is now that we have this web front end, that needs to make calls to our API server, we need to make sure we're doing those things through an authenticated way. So again, we're going to be able to get our, we need to take the JOT tokens from our logon user and make those requests. So if we go to the Mosaic page for, this is the page that's viewing your list of Mosaics. And in here, we can see here's our reload the Mosaics. It has our service client factory to create the mosaics in for us. This is our mosaic client factory. And where that's happening is we have, under clients, we have three different projects. The client generator, which is using NSWAG to generate our project, pointing at the Swagger document from our REST API. And then that creates this project over here, which is all the service clients for creating the clients or, or the mosaics or in the galleries. So what the service client in our Blazor applications job is, is to actually construct those individual service clients. You can see that's got its two methods here. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong file. Jumping ahead. Service client. We have here's click mosaics and gallery. Both those are constructing an HTTP client. Because that, and that's what's passed into our service client. In there, we can go use the Blazor APIs to go get our current logged on user. And from our logged on user, we can go get our Cognito user. And from there, the JOT token. And that's set as the authorization header on our HTTP client. So that code is very similar to what you used in that utility function. Correct. To get the so those generated token. clients I have are using this HTTP client, which is going to then have the JOT token set in the authorization header, and the REST API can then make authenticated requests. Okay. And so. that's what lets us move that code to start those backend processes into the API, yeah. knowing that they're authenticated. So other than that, though, again, it was pretty simple. We just used ASP.NET Core classes. We added our Cognito library to handle the authentication for us. Um, we also then can say, like in our galleries page, hey, you have to be in the admin user. So we can use the role-based security because Steve and I are in, in the admin group. So, um, again, we would like to go much more into the Blazor part, but we want to save rent time for the last demo, which I think is the coolest demo. It is indeed. It is. It is indeed. <laughs> so um, we had some usability issues, I think, in the last version, which was basically if you said I wanted to create a gallery or a mosaic, the status on the page says it was creating, and eventually you might see that it's done. So this year, we tried to make it a bit better, if you haven't noticed. If we go and so let's go to back to get off the swagger part. You know, I can go in here and I can say, uh, right there, there's you, can't you run it? There's you are, Steve. There's me. Steve and a koala bear. We used to use it with Amazon recognition to see who came up cuter. Me. So here now we're reporting more status here, because this is the status coming in from all of those Lambda functions in the back end. So we basically we wanted to connect our back end components, their status information, to the front end. 
And for that, we used WebSockets from API Gateway and broadcasted our messages from the back end. So let's take a look at how we did that. So again, if we focus on the Mosaic page, what we do at the start of this here is we have our communication factory, which creates our communication client. Now, this is my abstraction. This is Cloud Mosaic's abstraction around the WebSocket area up here. So let's take a look at what that does. I've lost my ability to see. There we go. Communication client. So the first part is very similar to what we just saw before with the HTTP client. We do all the work to get the JOT token. And then, and this is the nice thing about using Blazor, we're doing all this in .NET code. I'm just using .NET's client WebSocket class. This is just part of the, part of the standard library of .NET. Passing in our authorization header, very similar to what we saw with the HTTP client. And then I call connect on that, pointing to our WebSocket API. This is stored in API Gateway that we're pulling in here. So if we go look at API Gateway, here's our WebSocket EU point. And so in our case, our WebSocket is very simple. Um, our use case is simple, because all we're just doing is sort of a unidirectional. We want our back end components to send messages to our front end components. If we wanted something more interactive on the front end side, we could have more Lambda functions being switched off based off of this JSON path here to choose which path we want to use. But for us, all we really needed to do was we needed to connect and we needed to disconnect on our WebSocket. So we can look here, our connect is basically calling our onConnect Lambda function. Let's go back to Visual Studio. And in our communications folder, we've got two projects. One is our functions project. This is where those Lambda functions of connect and disconnect are defined. And our manager, which is where all of our components be able to work with. Our back end components are working with that manager to send messages. Our front end is working on that to listen to messages being sent through it. If we look at our connect method, so this Lambda function is called on that client WebSocket saying connect. And it's going to call our onConnect method. And we get our API gateway requests. And on the header is where we have our JOT token. So what we need to do now is we need to validate that JOT token and get the user from there. And so what I used is I used, again, .NET's classes for that. So I create the token validation parameters. This is just part of .NET's libraries to point to Cognito. Um, you can t again, you can check out the code in the repo, how that's done. Mostly, we're just setting the audience and the issuer to Cognito. And once that validation is done, we know who our user is, and we know they're a, that they've, there's a valid token. So what we need to do now, though, is our backend components are not going to know anything about WebSockets. They know who the user is. They know I'm creating a gallery for a user. I'm rendering a mosaic for a user. We need to be able to map a user back to the WebSocket. And that's done via the connection ID of the WebSocket. So what we're going to do is, from this API gateway request, we're going to capture the connection ID, the user, and as well, we also need to capture the API gateway endpoint URL. Those are the three things we're capturing here, is the endpoint URL, we already got the user, and we have our connection ID. And we're going to use our MetLogger manager to store that information. And we're storing that in DynamoDB, right? Right. So you can see here our logon is calling just the Dynamo put operation mm -hmm. to put those three fields in along with a date. And as I've logged on in the browser, that has caused that to happen. Every time you're logging into the browser right now, you're essentially writing that record in there that's storing that information. So I can have multiple connections. Yeah. So when we get to our mobile application, we'll have that one. Okay. We'll have multiple browsers. Um, Okay, so now what our backend components are going to be doing, though, they're again, they're not working with, uh, they're not working with WebSockets. They're just working with usernames. So what they're going to do is basically call the send message method. This send message takes in a message event. This is a class that's defined as part of Cloud Mosaic. It's my class that contains the state information. If we look at that, 
we can see it takes, it has the user, it's got, identifies the resource that was actually changing and what's the message on it. And this is what we want to send to um, our front end. So we serialize that because that's going to be our payload to send over to our browser. And then we're going to go query our dynamic table for that user to go get our list of connections. Now, this is going to get called for every single time I want to send a message. Like you might have saw when I upload a gallery, it's got all that percentage of uploading and things like that. That's a lot to, to write out there. Um, I don't necessarily want to query the database for every one of those, so I put a cache on mine to say, I'll cache that for 10 seconds, because I didn't think for my business requirements, a slight delay in getting statuses was acceptable. So once we have our list of connection IDs, and we have the message that we want to send, we have the endpoint that came from there as well. We use our Amazon API Gateway Management API client. I do love that name. I heard you like API, supporting an API in your API, right? Yes. <laughs> so but that's our client, right? That's that, one of our SDK clients. Yes, that is a SDK service client. If you've used SDK service clients, you're probably used to just specifying the region and sending off your request. This one works a little differently. You're not specifying the region. You're pointing it to that API gateway endpoint, the, the WebSocket endpoint that we created. So that one that we have there gets set as the service URL there. Once we have that client, we just call the post message with our connection ID, the data we want to send, and we send that off. And that's all it is. So our backend components now have broadcasted their messages out through that package. And then if we go back to our Mosaic page, we can see here's our endless reader of messages. It's using our communication to read events from that. So this is reading from that client WebSocket, which gets back a JSON document. And then this then serializes that JSON document back into our message event object. And now we know everything we need to know on the UI to update the screen. So that's how we're able to basically tie all those together, tying our front end and our back end um, statuses by using WebSockets and the, that, uh, that ridiculously long named New service client. <laughs> um, so that's all we want to show there. Um, again, it's if you want to know more about how to set that up, if you look at the CloudFormation template here, this has got all of the setup for how you actually, through CloudFormation, create a WebSocket API. All right. So that was a lot of a lot of stuff. I mean, it feels like a lot, but it's actually quite simple at the end of the day. And it, it is in the GitHub repo, so you can go and take a check of that. I'm going to skip over recapping this because we'll end up running short of time because I know we want to talk about code pipeline very briefly because we've mentioned code build a couple of times. Um, right. So, and I'm going back to slides. Nope. <laughs> um, sorry about that. So, yeah, we did a lot of demos through Visual Studio, a lot of demos through the command line. I don't expect you actually pushing, pushing to prod via that way. It's just a way to learn these tools. That, that's always been my view. If you look at that Cloud Mosaic pipeline template, it shows you how, you've, how I've set up all of my, pip my pipeline and all the code build jobs for this. Um, all the build scripts are in there as well. Um, this is how I would set it up because I have everything in the same repo. And uh, you probably would have each component in separate repos. But there's enough material in that shows you how do you actually use .NET Core um, and our code services to deploy to um, Lambda and Batch and Fargate. There. All right. So session recap. So we've gone through a lot of stuff, um, admittedly. Um, the slides will be available. Remember, everything is in that GitHub repo. Um, maybe do the user resources. So there's the repo. The master branch is last year's version of the application with all of the architectural documents, how it works, et cetera. So you can go and dig into this. And then you can use the reInvent 2019 branch to see all the changes that we've made this year. Um, the GitHub. Uh, Aegis.net Home, where all of our open source tools are listed, the jumping off points of all the different packages and uh, things that we've used. It's there, github.com slash AWS slash DOTnet, and the .NET blog uh, homepage. Um, Norman and I are going to hang around outside the room um, for a few moments after the presentation. So if you've got any questions, feel free to come up and ask. We, we do need to clean the room out, clear the room out for the next presentation. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed the conference. <laughs>